All right. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? Thanks for uh, joining our webinar here. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Just throw a message in chat if you can't hear me. Uh, it should be on the right-hand side if you have any troubles. So oh, thanks, Jen. Really appreciate it. Um, it's funny, this uh, system is very one way, so I am just talking to basically myself here. So yeah, uh, so so just to kick off, hey Chris, hey Rachel, hey Jen, uh, hey everybody else. Um, appreciate everybody taking the, take, uh, taking the time out of their busy day to join us today. Um, I thought I would uh, just present what we're looking at doing here in, uh, well, a recap of what we did in, in the crazy year that was 2020 and um, what we'll be looking to achieve in 2021. Um, so uh, today's uh, lineup will be uh, a mix of things. Uh, we've got a bit of a diverse audience here, so we will have um, some content that some of you who have joined us before will be a bit familiar with, and then we'll have some new content as well on top of that. Um, trying to just cater to multiple audiences here. Um, if there's any questions, uh, do feel free to, to, to ping and chat along the way. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on it and uh, pick them up as we go um, and try to get to uh, as many as, as, as come up. And uh, with that, why don't we get started? Um, so obviously we're curators ease here. Uh, wanted to just start off the uh, conversation with uh, how the organization started. Uh, it feels like a lifetime ago now that we uh, kicked off back in uh, late 2017, uh, early 2018. But um, as a good number of you know, and, and for those of you who may not know yet, uh, the the organization, uh, the catalyst behind it was my younger, uh, it was and is my younger brother, Terry, who has a uh, ultra rare mutation um, on the dystrophin gene. And so that's resulted in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, given uh, Terry's mutation, uh, as well as Asian ambulatory status, uh, like a lot of you out there with with kids or, uh, that are affected or personally affected, um, he, he wasn't amenable to uh, the few clinical trials that were, uh, were and are going on. And so um, thankfully, uh, I had a, a great connection with uh, Tim Yu at Boston Children's Hospital, and uh, I'll tell more about that in a couple slides, but um, Terry became the catalyst for this, and now uh, I'm pleased to say we've got uh, so many so many faces that have joined here at Disease Sense, and it's, it's, um, I enjoy reflecting on it a lot of the time to see how far we've come in, in uh, what feels like a long time, but when we, you know, when I look at the calendar, it's, it's been a relatively short period of time. But, um, you know, the essence of the mission is really informed by the fact that uh, a lot of traditional drug development uh, is is really geared towards populations. And and so uh, for, for my brother and others like him, that really wasn't going to be an amenable situation where where we had 10 years and, and $2 billion to spare. And so, uh, you know, it, it really became very, very obvious very quickly that we needed to reinvent this process somehow. And, and that reinvention would come um, really on the heels of of Dr. Tim Yu and the work that he had done uh, with uh, that little girl, Mila, who, whose uh, picture you can see there, um, and the development of a customized uh, ASO, or antisense oligonucleotide uh, technology that would um, uh, repair her genetic mutation uh, due to Batten's disease. So not Duchenne, but the idea and, uh, and, and really path that Tim blazed forward with um, in developing in, in quick time a customized ASO for, for Mila um, and ended up saving her life. Uh, Mila's still with us today now, um, I think almost four years later. Uh, so it's, it, it was quite a whirlwind, but the, the model that we could take a technology um, relatively quickly, uh, cater it to differing mutations. Uh, of course, DMD is where we started, but this technology is far more amenable, uh, whether it's an ASO or whether it's CRISPR uh, or gene replacement. The idea that we could um, cater technology to an, even an individual's mutation is something that really resonated. And so while Dr. Yu, uh, by training, isn't a DMD doc uh, or a neuromuscular doc, um, it, it, it really uh, became necessary to form our own team. And so that's exactly what we've done here. And um, while all the, the faces of the people who have made radical differences in this mission um, won't fit on the slide, you know, the idea that we're trying to merge cross-functional groups uh, from discovery with the likes of Dr. Leck and Dr. Kunkel to preclinical manufacturing, regulatory, and ultimately clinical expertise as we sort of move from left to right on the slide is, is something that's allowed us to move uh, very quickly. And so the, the while some of these uh, photos may be familiar, uh, Brenda Wong being at University of Massachusetts, uh, Monkel Leck at, at Yale, 
Um, some of the some of the faces on here may not be as familiar. Uh, the likes of Dr. Black uh, at Charles River, uh, who had worked with Dr. Tim Mew in the very beginning days to to forge what would become a regulatory path. Um, how does the FDA look at customized therapeutics differently than therapeutics designed for larger populations? Um, and and so really taking advantage of of, of these these buckets of talent to bring them all together and 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 blaze forward this path into customized therapeutics. Um, as we've learned, uh, as we've moved down this journey, um, very fortunate to have the likes of Richard Snyder and Michelle Berg uh, with manufacturing expertise. These this emerging field of gene therapies, whether they're ASOs or CRISPR or gene replacement. Um, really anything with AAV being CRISPR and gene replacement, it's really hard to make. And so uh, as sort of at this stage as a whole, when we look at industry uh, broadly, um, nowadays it's very, uh, we're at the early stages of being able to develop and actually efficiently produce um, AAV and, and, and CRISPR as it relates to therapeutics. And so um, it saved us a lot of uh, pain and hardship by bringing this team together. And I think a specific example of that uh, it was actually just a, a few months ago. Um, Monkel's team uh, for our first therapeutic had designed it using a certain uh, bacterial backbone. Um, and so that, that's quite common in these processes. Uh, however, we came to learn that the ba initial backbone that they had selected actually wouldn't pass muster when it came to manufacturing and regulatory approval. So we were able to quickly change that out uh, with little to no delay in the process. But thankfully, that 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 insight that came from um, that team being cohesively put together was able to to really um, save us that that uh, that unnecessary uh, expense and time uh, being consumed if we would have to uh, go back and redesign from the beginning. So you know, just one of the many examples I think that we've encountered so far uh, in this custom drug development program, and many many more to come. But just the first one that comes to mind. And so cure our disease, uh, you know, this is what we do again for folks who have joined us before. This will probably be a relatively familiar slide. We uh, will be adding a new collaborator to this in the coming months as we start to, to scale up these, these different Duchenne uh, customized drugs. But essentially cure our disease is, is the hub and spoke model here. Uh, we act to bring the researchers, both academic and industry together um, and to help manage the R&D and of course raise the capital and awareness necessary to continue to fuel the engine forward. Um, and you can think of our, our program much like a relay race. Um, what starts with the initial uh, characterization of the patient mutation, generally done by uh, first by UMass and then uh, through whole genome sequencing at Yale, um, the baton then passes to Yale where they take that uh, critical information from whole genome sequencing and then uh, conceptualize it into uh, what would become a series of therapeutic constructs. So um, uh, a common misunderstanding is that uh, Yale uh, is informed by the whole genome sequencing and then um, develops one therapeutic construct. Well, in reality, we actually develop a battery of therapeutic constructs unique to that individual mutation, um, five, six, seven, eight, nine, depending on, on sort of the complexity or the type of mutation we're looking at. That battery of constructs is then uh, tested in vitro and, and then ranked and prioritized to see, okay, which, which ones look like they'll perform the best through mostly an efficacy lens, we do look through a genetic safety lens to look at whether any of the sequences, uh, the code that, that makes up uh, the constructs, a series of ATCGs essentially, um, will, will have any, any uh, similarity to um, uh, any, any genes we want to avoid turning on or turning off with CRISPR. So um, once that initial battery of constructs is, is made, tested and prioritized, then we go uh, and kick it over to our, our friends at Charles River where we'll start preclinical testing with figuring out how much do we give and, and what's the safety profile of it. Of course, before we, we seek the FDA's approval uh, to dose and before dosing, of course, we'll manufacture uh, with Eldevron and Virogen. And I'll get more into this in a bit later. Um, but as, as we've gone on, it's been interesting to raise questions of how do we how do we do in vivo testing for duplication, for instance? Um, it's very, very technically challenging, if not impossible, to create a duplication mouse model, humanized, uh, as, as we'll need to go into humanized CRISPR, uh, humanized mouse model since we're using a human-specific therapy being CRISPR. Um, and so we, we've, we've done a lot of thinking of, you know, to what degree can we make use of 2D and 3D modeling uh, to understand efficacy 
if in case a mouse model is not possible, as it will be with a number of, of duplications. Um, and so uh, parts, of, parts of us scaling this model have really raised interesting questions of how can we streamline and how can we uh, simplify some of the preclinical development work? And is it really necessary to do the same uh, safety testing on AAV uh, 9 that we deliver with, and I'll get to that later, um, if we already have a good understanding based on not only our data, both preclinical and, and soon to be clinical, but also other, other companies using uh, AAV 9, for instance, Pfizer, for instance, uh, Novartis with their SMA gene therapy. And so it's really starting to help us uh, coalesce around some very clear and, and, and targeted uh, advocacy that we want to do moving into 2021 to usher in the development of, of, of a guidelines from the FDA as it relates to a single patient drug development, what's called N of one or N equals a few in this case. Um, and so, you know, while, while our core team remains the same, uh, we're starting to see uh, an expansion of collaborators um, to different skill sets and expertise. And uh, I know the slide could much, be much busier if we uh, put every group that we interact with here, but the idea that Cura Disease acts as really the hub of, of this research and, and is the driving force in coalescing it all together and knitting it together for um, what will be a very uh, holistic um, solution for the individual down the road. And so this is a little bit about our process. Um, some of you have seen this before again, but for those of you that haven't, uh, we really start uh, with characterizing the individual's mutation and their uh, molecular characterization uh, that's going on. Um, not all mutations are the same, um, and even with similar uh, or the same mutations, we see very different phenotypic outcomes. And so the reason or the question that rises is not necessarily why, uh, but the more actionable question is, what do we have to do to treat this specific mutation to, to result in, in a functional improvement for the individual that we're treating? And so once that characterization is done, and it's not necessarily as clean in real life as step one, two, three, four, but a uh, 30,000 foot view is that characterizing the, the mutation through whole genome sequencing um, in parallel developing a cell line, uh, once whole genome sequencing is done, that allows our team at Yale to actually go and develop those constructs I mentioned before, um, ultimately targeting uh, full length or as near full length dystrophin production as we can get uh, based on the mutation at hand, of course. There are some mutations that are easier and there are some mutations that are harder. Um, ultimately, once we've got a, a, a prioritized list of therapeutic constructs that we've seen uh, in vitro or in a dish um, efficacy with, we'll then move into um, optimizing those in a mouse model if applicable, or go to that next step of can we take a 2D or 3D models of the patient tissue, um, dose that, that converted muscle or that converted uh, cardiac muscle, and then actually measure the, the functional change that we see in those treated cells. So, you know, imagine a dish of uh, heart cells or cardiomyocytes as they're as they're more properly called and and we can actually measure what's called the contractile force or the force at which they they uh, uh, beat um, both pre and post treatment and the hope of course is that you know we start with a baseline characterize where the patient or the individual is at baseline uh, apply the treatment and then actually measure okay what's what's the change in contractile force um, over a period of time and that gives us a greater degree of efficacy um, than, than just a biomarker or, or increasing uh, dystrophin on a, on a RNA or, or a protein basis, actually seeing a functional readout, although not in a mouse, but in a, in a dish of the patient's own cells, taking that uh, concept of in vitro efficacy just one step further to uh, this 2D and 3D modeling, which is um, new work that uh, we've started in 2020 uh, at the tail end and, and we'll be pushing more forward to in 2021 uh, with, some, with some new partners that are coming on board. Um, in addition, of course, the efficacy, of course, is the paramount question of safety. Um, with safety, it's a little bit more streamlined. Safety, we're able to actually do that in um, more generic forms of the humanized DMD mouse. In fact, you can actually do safety assessments in a traditional uh, a mouse, which is called the C57 Black. Um, not that there's a test or anything at the end of this, but um, as, it, as it pertains to safety, uh, the FDA and our collaborators, of course, like to see you know, how did the therapeutic uh, perform in the mouse, knowing that the guide RNA that are a part of that therapeutic 
uh, what basically the guide RNA where it tells you to go on the individual's genome, the zip code you can uh, uh, create an analogy for, um, won't be as active in the mouse, um, but the other aspects will, the, the AAV, the protein, uh, Cas9 included in that. And so, you know, we get a good look at, you know, what, what was the immune response? Was there massive amounts of inflammation? And, and one can infer that, uh, you know, some sort of uh, immune response. Um, we haven't seen that, but that is what we look for. Um, and then also looking on a genetic level. Um, people uh, toss around the word CRISPR quite a bit, but looking at um, are we turning on or turning off genes that we really shouldn't be or don't want to be? Um, that's called bioinformatics. It, it's, it's a very emerging field, but what we're able to do is take a, a dish again of the patient cells, treat it with the therapeutic, and then actually do what's called RNA sequencing on it. And RNA sequencing allows us to get a look at, at the transcript activity. Um, and and, and uh, for those of you uh, taking notes at home, you'll remember that uh, DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein is the general flow. And so um, when we look at the RNA level or the transcriptome, are there transcripts that are that are starting to be turned on that are significant that would be cause for concern? And that really gives us a peek of, you know, are again, are we turning on or turning off something we really want to avoid turning on or turning off? And and the data that you get back um, is, is quite noisy. Um, so you'll see basically this uh, uh, X and Y axis, and then all of a sudden there'll be a cloud of different genes that were that were changed. And you really have to pull in a great deal of bioinformatics expertise, fortunately, that we have with um, uh, Dr. Leck being a, a world-renowned expert in that field to be able to discern and analyze that data. It's not black and white. It's very, um, uh, very much so required to um, interpret and, and then analyze, okay, is this, is this significant or is this insignificant? Um, and so that's, that's really one of the final parts of the safety assessment. And then uh, we'll, we'll go to the FDA to have our IND meeting. Uh, assuming approval and then dose. Um, this slide is a little overly simplified, I should say, because the uh, the actual the FDA experience is a bit more involved in this. So as I'll, as I'll mention uh, later in the deck, um, the the first uh, instance with the FDA that we've had at least is what was called a pre IND meeting. Um, IND standing for uh, investigational uh, new drug, and so. Um, the pre ind meeting is a nice experience for us to have our progress reviewed by the FDA and then also get their feedback on our proposed plan uh, moving into the clinic as well so that there are essentially very little to no surprises uh, once we do have that IND meeting right here between uh, step three and step four. So more on that later, but just to give you an idea of, the, of their overall process. Um, so this, uh, I need to update this slide with some of the other patients we've done. I do have a bit of a higher level uh, perspective in the coming slides, but the first, you know, the, I think just to kind of color what, I, what I've been saying in the, in the last few, few sentences, um, you know, we've been able to take uh, our first patient, Terry, and uh, modify and upregulate his dystrophin um, level to a sufficient uh, point where we think there'll be a, a good amount of clinical benefit. Now, the important thing here is to note that every patient has a different strategy. Um, Terry's strategy is an exon one uh, oriented strategy. That would not be a, a strategy that we'd necessarily want to use for a downstream duplication or a downstream deletion. Um, what we like to do is, uh, as, as, as the uh, sort of theme implies of customization, is really customize the therapeutic strategy based on the, on the mutation at hand. And so, um, you know, a couple of our other patients would look, slide would look somewhat different to this, but ultimately the goal is the same. The goal is to upregulate dystrophin uh, protein so that there is a clinical difference, uh, an impactful clinical difference, I should say. Um, and, and so, uh, again, sort of coloring, coloring the, uh, coloring the conversation with uh, a bit of uh, text here in terms of our mouse study. Our, our mouse study back in March um, was able to show that both arm uh, robust upregulation of uh, dystrophin uh, in vivo. So for, uh, for Terry, we're able to actually uh, use a mouse model in this case, uh, given that it's a deletion. Um, and so, you know, uh, in vivo data is quite good and quite valuable. And, and, and uh, and we were able to present this to the FDA uh, to get their feedback, which, which was supportive. Um, we have one more study, which will be a three month, uh, what's called farm tox. It's a combination of efficacy and safety, basically uh, testing uh, efficacy in more mice and, and then doing that safety uh, test that I mentioned where, you know, we'll dose, uh, I think it's uh, 80 mice uh, with a couple different doses. 
um, and understand what, what happens inside those mice uh, over the course of three months. Um, the goal, of course, is to see that all mice remain healthy, uh, continue to gain weight, and, and more or less have a relatively boring ex existence. Um, and that, that'll be our, our, final, our final study before we move to the FDA. Um, so, so just kind of looking at 20, uh, 2020 in, in a nutshell, um, certainly a challenging year, I think, uh, least to say. Um, our our pre-INZ meeting, as I mentioned earlier, uh, went went well with the FDA. It was it was our first interaction and my first interaction with the FDA. And I have to say that um, the feedback uh, that we received was 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 really very very helpful. Um, you know, we we go in with uh, I think it must have been an 80, 90 page document, and, and generally there's uh, several sections in, when as it pertains to the FDA, um, whether it's a pre-IND or IND. But essentially, you've got your your sort of background. Uh, disease background, mouse model background, um, technology background, and then you've got your non-clinical studies. So this is what we would call preclinical. Um, what did the mouse data look like? What did the in vitro data look like? And then you've got your manufacturing data. And essentially, it's this very long section that goes into how, how the um, therapeutics made, both the plasmid, which uh, you may know is the uh, actual therapeutic part of the drug, what goes in the AAV. And then you've got the AAV, which is uh, essentially a delivery truck to uh, systemically deliver that throughout the body. Um, when, we, when you look at the FDA, uh, there's generally three main points or three main types of meetings that we we'd have for this type of, initi of initiative. Uh, there's what's called an interact meeting. It stands for a long acronym that uh, I'll, I'll save uh, Google to answer that one on. Um, and this one is is very early stage. So this is where there's generally um, some data, but not a ton of data. And um, you go to the FDA to to more so get their get their non-binding, which is important, non-binding guidance on on what your plan is, on on what your plan is for both, especially the preclinical study, since that would be what would be coming uh, generally next with an interact meeting, um, and less so on the clinical side. It's a it's a good chance to be able to ask questions, and that folds nicely into the next interaction with the FDA, which is what's called a pre-INZ meeting. That's what we had in October. And that's a chance to get binding feedback um, with the FDA, um, as well as their perspective on, on the program moving forward uh, into the clinic. And so um, both uh, Interact and pre-INZ are actually optional meetings. Um, sponsors, uh, any company that develops a drug and aims to get in the clinic is, is called a sponsor. Uh, but sponsors are strongly encouraged to have pre-IND meetings. Um, essentially, it's a vehicle to uh, eliminate the chance of having um, unpleasant surprises at the end. Um, and, and that's something we certainly elected to do, given that this will be a, a first in human for Duchenne um, of a transcriptional activator. And so um, following up on that, and, and the documents build on, on themselves, I should say, before I get to the INZ meeting, um, the documents that you prepare for an interact meeting, generally 10, 20-ish pages, um, build then for the pre-INZ meeting, which as I mentioned, um, ours was 80, 90, 100 or so pages. And not necessarily the page length that matters here, it's just going to give you an idea that um, it's a cumulative effort that ultimately results in this IND meeting, which is where you go to the FDA and, and you present your data, um, you present uh, your clinical plan for, for follow-up, and then you seek their permission to dose. And generally, the FDA is about 30 days after that meeting to uh, provide a response. Um, it, in some cases, you can request uh, an emergency IND or compassionate care. That's not something that we've pursued, um, but that is something that that some companies uh, or some some programs do pursue. And there's a lot of different shapes and flavor to, to interactions with the FDA. Now, if you're a medical device, um, it's, it's a different pathway. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to do here with the FDA is actually uh, work with them to get uh, new guidelines issued for uh, what's called N of 1 or N of a few drug development. This is a, this is a very different uh, flavor of regulatory perspective than um, is sort of traditionally done. Um, traditional in the sense that drugs are, are made for larger populations. Um, you know, hundreds, thousands types, whereas we're really looking at um, uh, singles to dozens type of people at a time. And so there are different requirements uh, for different programs. Now, uh, a program for one individual um, shouldn't have sort of the same burdens put upon it as um, a, a program for, you know, a much more chronic disease like diabetes or obesity. It's two very different uh, two very different um, indications and also two very different needs of a population. Um, and so that is something that 
um, not only we work on, uh, uh, Dr. Yu and, and his collaborators are working on advancing um, guidelines that will be for sort of that number of patients, that N equals one or N equals a few, um, not necessarily um, just by in, by type of technology used, uh, whether it's an ASO or whether it's CRISPR, um, but, but we really uh, do need those guidelines. Right now they're quite informal, so we go to the FDA, you know, we have one animal model we've tested this in, um, and, and a, a quite streamlined uh, preclinical package. Um, and so, you know, informally, that's something that's okay. And we've seen um, a couple other custom ASO programs go through with that. Um, but, but our goal is really cement those guidelines. So we can really leave an example um, for others who, who do come upon this um, down the road as we start to see an increase in the growth of customized therapeutics, not for Duchenne necessarily, but for other diseases that are gene code type diseases um, or, or others where there's truly only one patient in the world. Um, and so that, that that's a, a significant effort of ours in 2021 um, that we'll be working with the FDA on. Overall, though, I think um, for, for, for us, the, the FDA's feedback was really great because it allows us to um, take this framework that we've operated in, this, this packet, this development cycle that I showed you a few slides ago, and really apply it not only to our first patient, but our second, third, fourth, and nth patient. Um, it gives us a, a, a somewhat informal playbook to, to move forward by. Um, and precedent to build upon um, as we as we dose our first and then subsequent patients. So um, regulatory science is a whole science and, and into of itself, and uh, I'm glad we have a, a great regulatory team uh, put together to help help guide us through this uh, a very complicated um, set of guidelines and regulations. But um, cer certainly necessary. You know, I think at the end of the day, it's it's we look at the FDA as a collaborator and and a group that uh, has has purview over a number of programs. Right? They don't just see ours; they see um, any any really U.S. program uh, of a U.S. company that will do uh, clinical trials here, um, and even some abroad, of course, depending on the on the on where the company is domiciled. But um, you know, being able to take take their perspective um, and learn from that has been something that's very valuable for us. Um, and while they don't share details, of course, of individual companies and individual programs, um, their perspective is informed by all those individual companies and programs. And so um, it, it's been quite helpful. And I, I, I think our team would agree that we found the FDA to be very collaborative um, and, and uh, very supportive uh, in, in, uh, in, this, in our efforts specifically, of course, but um, more broadly, uh, single patient or NMFU drug development. Um, so another accomplishment of 2020 was uh, the manufacturing of the human grade therapeutic. Uh, so I, I was really interested to see, you know, what does this look like exactly? And so just before I dive into the pictures and the FedEx truck and all that, um, taking a step back, um, the, the manufacturing of, of, a, of a gene therapy is a, is a multi-step process. Broadly, it's, it's manufacturing the plasmid, which is the actual component that you want to get to the muscle that actually does the work. Um, however, you can't just inject plasmid as it's not going to systemically deliver really efficiently throughout the body. You need to put it in AAV, which is uh, basically a FedEx truck and, and why that picture is there. And so um, that, that uh, test tube you see on your left um, is the plasmid human grade for our first drug. And we've learned a lot about the, the sort of time it takes to uh, manufacture these highly complicated materials. Um, it took about three months uh, full steam to, to manufacture the plasmid for our first patient. Um, and at the end of the day, essentially, we have um, about 80 tubes that you see there uh, manufactured. And, and the liquid looks like nothing special, to be honest. It's a, it's a, it's a relatively translucent liquid um, that's stored at a very cold temperature, about negative yeah, 80 uh, degrees Celsius, um, similar to what you might hear uh, uh, that the Pfizer vaccine needs to be stored for uh, coronavirus. So we take this plasmid. Um, the plasmid uh, consists of uh, the CRISPR system, so the, the Cas9 protein, the guide RNA, um, as well as uh, among other things, but notably the, the muscle specific promoter. And that promoter allows um, the drug, while it'll be delivered systemically and will hit multiple tissues, liver, kidneys, um, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, um, and diaphragm and, and other tissues, both uh, muscle and non-muscle related, the fact that there's a muscle promoter in there will only allow it to turn on in that muscle. And so, you know, you don't want dystrophin, for instance, being produced in, you know, your kidney, it's, it's not gonna do much there. And so um, given that that promoter turns on uh, in the presence of, of other muscle, um, allows us to have the, it, it's a, not only a safety check, but also gives us the confidence that we'll see um, that, that uh, therapeutic have action in the targeted tissues that we want rather than uh, off-target tissues. 
So uh, AAV packaging, that takes about another three to four months. It's a bit of a long haul. Um, uh, we uh, basically uh, will produce uh, first in a two liter bo- uh, batch. And then that two liter batch uh, is, is really a feasibility run. Uh, uh, our, our manufacturing partner, ViralGen, who will do the packaging or is doing the packaging, um, they'll produce this two liter run. That two liter run uh, gets a check as to whether it's feasible to manufacture this. Uh, again, manufacturing cannot um, over overemphasize enough the complexity that goes into this. Um, then we'll move on to the uh, 250 liter batch, uh, which uh, both will be GMP, but the 250 liter will be what's used for um, human administration and also our farm talks. Um, a lot of um, our, where our thinking is gravitating towards is it's um, best to use the material that will go into the human for that final study so that there's there's no inconsistency between, um, or no, there's less risk of inconsistency, I should say, uh, between the two batches, we we really are able to minimize that, and so the results that we see from the farm talks uh, would directly inform the the substance that will will seek the FDA's permission to uh, to dose with. Um, so yeah, very complicated. Um, you know, in the future, as as we as a society get more efficient at producing AAV, right now we're sort of in the very early days. But as that efficiency starts to pick up, we'll start to see those timelines compress, and also hopefully the cost for, uh, 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 compress as well. Um, you know, we're we're fortunate to have a, a great partnership with ViralGen and and uh, as well as Columbus Children's Foundation, who have helped to uh, make the cost of AAV much more approachable um, than than it would have been otherwise. And I think that's a testament to to their belief in this program that. Um, you know, they believe in where we're going and the work that we're doing. And so they've, um, they've not uh, only put their word in the game, but also have skin in the game now to, to where they, they want to see us succeed. And I'm and, uh, quite grateful for that and their partnership. Um, so we, we've also adan- uh, advanced two additional mutations in the preclinical development. So we've got a, a dupe 20 to 25 and a deletion of 46 to 51. So this is really the, the point where we started to say, okay, how, um, and this isn't recently, but several months ago, started to look and say, okay, how, how, do, how could we see, get more confidence around efficacy if, for instance, our dupe 20 to 25, dupe meaning duplication, excuse me, and, and del meaning deletion, of course, um, how, how can we get confident about the, the duplication, uh, the efficacy of the, of, the, of the drug for the duplication patient um, if we can't make a mouse model? So that's really where um, 2D and 3D modeling started to come into play and, and looking at 2D and 3D models of skeletal muscle um, as well as cardiac muscle. And so it's, it's helped to advance our thinking around this. Um, and, and, and the precedent that we'll set with, with this first duplication patient will benefit all, all other duplication patients, hopefully not even just for Duchenne, right? I think the idea that, that this is to some degree disease agnostic is, is something that we're keenly aware of and, 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 uh, looking, looking to, uh, looking to advance in this. And so, um, we'll be bringing in another, another collaborator soon here. The, the contract's not quite signed, but once it is, we'll, we'll make an announcement about it and um, share, share details about them and their, and their technology that we're looking to use. So um, it's quite exciting. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's exciting to see uh, these two additional drugs advance. And, and really, it's for, for a good, uh, a, a good um, I mean, these two are for two specific um, patients, but the idea that we can take this and um, you know, scale it up with partners to others who may have these mutations, um, we, aren't, we aren't aware of others who have uh, these, these specific mutations, at least that we've worked with, but um, really blazing that trail for those specific mutations so that others can benefit in the future. I'm um, a little peek, uh, not not entirely comprehensive here, but a little peek on sort of the uh, the program at large. Um, we're we're really trying to figure out now how do we scale this. So in addition to the two that have entered preclinical development, we've got a slew of uh, mutations that are um, currently undergoing whole genome sequencing, and you can kind of see the the rest of the chart there. Um, that uh, you know where where we'll go next in terms of sequence, develop construct, test, validate moving to preclinical testing. And so um, the, the, that's where we'll spend a good amount of 2021 on is how do we advance those, those, uh, those earlier constructs into uh, preclinical development and ultimately clinical development. You'll note we do have one LGMD. Um, this one doesn't quite perfectly fit into this, uh, into this uh, structure here, but um, again, trying to see uh, qu- with quite an adjacent disease, uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, um, to what degree can we harness this process again and, and drag it through. Um, more to come on that. 
Uh, so in addition to our um, in, in addition to our work in muscular dystrophies, again, trying to understand um, how how can we take this this uh, compartmentalized structure we've developed, as I showed you earlier, and 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 uh, scale it up with a different disease. So switching out the early stage academic investigator and switching in a new investigator, this specifically for a neurodegenerative disease uh, that that we're looking at uh, for a, on a customized basis. Um, and then dragging it through the process the same. So I'm trying to scale in a couple of different ways in parallel. Um, and, and a lot of this comes down to, um, in this case, we'll, we'll be using an ASO rather than a CRISPR-based therapeutic, but it does seem that a lot of the neuromuscular diseases are um, more um, potentially amenable, at least with Duchenne and limb girdle, more amenable to either a gene replacement or CRISPR-based strategy. Whereas some of the neurodegenerative diseases, um, the SCA3, SCA1, um, and others are, are potentially more amenable to an ASO type of strategy. And I think a lot of that has to do with delivery. Um, if you think about muscle, um, it, it's it's for about 40% of your mass and it's really all it, quite a bit of different places in your body you know, from your uh, from your head down to your toes and, and virtually everywhere in between. Whereas with the with the neurodegenerative system, it, it's, it's more focused on, on the central nervous system. And so the brain and spinal cord areas are a bit more compartmentalized. And so delivery there is a little bit easier. Um, versus uh, delivery with an ASO systemically is very challenging. Um, it, ASOs have a hard time sort of escaping out of the bloodstream into the muscle and then inside the muscle cells themselves, um, which which has been historically a challenge. But um, more to come on this one as, as, as we advance. So as I mentioned, we're using uh, AAV9 uh, as the delivery truck here. The idea here is that if we can use a common base of, of AAV delivery, uh, to what degree can we simplify our preclinical package? We know there'll be other delivery vehicles in the future, other AAVs that are more um, rationally designed. And, and someday in the future, um, uh, many, many years likely in the future, non-viral delivery. Non-viral delivery is tough. We've heard of lipid nanoparticles uh, uh, for diseases that affect the eyes or defect uh, affect the liver and kidneys, it's it's a bit easier to get to those um, organs of choice because a lot of the therapeutics uh, naturally gravitate towards those organs. Whereas with muscle, it's a little bit more difficult. But um, until that time comes, you know, really harnessing this common base of delivery, um, like I mentioned, being the FedEx truck, and it's not a perfect delivery, delivery vehicle by any means. Um, you know, I've listed some of the risks there in terms of uh, no ability to redose, which, you know, we'll touch on in a bit. Um, uh, Pre-existing immunities uh, in terms of neutralizing antibodies to, to AAV um, has, has become a, a relatively large issue, um, which we've heard a number of patients uh, have not been able to engage in a clinical trial because of these, these uh, pre-existing immunities. Um, AAV is a virus, right? And so the ability to um, get the same virus twice is what's challenging there. Um, once you've uh, had the virus administered, your body develops these antibodies, uh, making it uh, very challenging to re-administer uh, an AAV again. But um, while it's not a perfect vehicle, it does seem to be one of the best uh, vehicles that we have uh, today at our disposal. And that's a, that's a big uh, theme uh, with cure disease is the idea that Yes, there will always be better technology in the future, uh, but we need to look at helping uh, the patients that we have today uh, rather than um, necessarily trying to trying to delay, delay, delay until we can, um, you know, get to that uh, non-viral delivery or, or, or a more catered AAV. And so um, more, more to come on that, of course, as well. And uh, happy to field any questions on that um, if, if there are any as well. Um, so I thought a helpful slide uh, that we've used in the past is sort of comparing uh, microdystrophin to CRISPR. Um, so so uh, both strategies uh, certainly are interesting and really any strategy that helps to uh, mitigate the threat that is Duchenne and really other rare diseases, one that's welcome. But the idea with uh, microdystrophin is that um, the, the body with whatever mutation you may now have uh, can't effectively produce, we use uh, Duchenne as an example here, um, the body can't uh, use its innate infrastructure to produce dystrophin. And so um, uh, researchers have taken a mini form of dystrophin, uh, mini because there's a packaging limitation on AAV, um, taken that mini form of dystrophin, highlighting the uh, supposed important parts of the gene, um, cloning those into an AAV and then delivering them. And so basically what you've got almost is uh, a mini form of dystrophin that your body has and then can uh, produce uh, a shortened dystrophin uh, uh, version with. Um, you can sort of take the analogy of, of giving a man a fish. Um, 
And that's the idea is that in as many muscle cells as you can hit or myoblasts, uh, you are introducing a mini uh, dystrophin structure into those cells. And so um, the idea is that once those cells turn over, that, that mini dystrophin structure is gone, um, leaving behind uh, the innate infrastructure that was left behind. CRISPR is a little bit different. Uh, the idea with CRISPR is that you actually introduce the edits on a DNA level so that uh, you're taking the body's innate DNA, modifying it so that the cells can uh, produce healthy uh, muscle for multiple generations. And there's been a couple papers published, one by Charlie Gersbach that was quite interesting that showed that um, AAV delivered CRISPR actually hit the satellite cells, which, which gives a degree of confidence that um, multiple generations of cells will still carry that uh, CRISPR infrastructure and therefore allow the body to um, use that CRISPR machinery to, to repair those genetic defects that have been, um, that have, that have been identified. Um, how, how durability is always a question here. How long will it last? Um, the answer is we don't know yet. Um, we, we look at uh, similar studies, uh, although not perfectly apples to apples, studies in uh, sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia, where uh, I believe the, the longevity, longevity of the data produced so far is about a year. And, and we're still seeing good, good uh, signs of efficacy there, which is really encouraging um, that, that so far as the data, as, as the data portrays, um, efficacy continues to happen with those cases. Um, it'll be very interesting to see the, the durability with CRISPR as well. I think that's an open question that industry broadly has is, you know, how long will this last? Um, you know, we've heard some early reports of microdystrophin and its longevity there, but I'm um, still very anecdotal in nature. Um, but uh, but great steps in the right direction. But thought it would be at least helpful to to compare and contrast those two different modalities. So, um, microdystrophin has several trials uh, active, and uh, CRISPR um, is advancing as well. Um, so with, uh, as the slide says, uh, neutralizing antibodies mentioned just a few minutes ago are, are a significant challenge. Um, and it's really a challenge that's brought on by the, by, by the nature of AAV. Uh, AAV, as I mentioned, stands for Dino Associated Virus. And so um, the body produces defenses to viruses uh, naturally. So that's, for instance, why we don't necessarily get the same cold twice. And uh, ironically, uh, that's what we're hoping to generate with the COVID vaccine is uh, antibodies to the COVID um, uh, a virus. Um, antibodies, uh, neutralizing antibodies are unique to the protein or, an or sorry, antigen that they're trying to uh, render uh, harmless. Um, and they do that by binding. So you can kind of think of, you know, imagine a C of AAV with a unique uh, sort of lock, and then um, your body generates uh, a number of keys that fits that lock. Um, that will render the, the virus um, ineffective. And so um, neutralizing antibodies, uh, significant levels, everybody generally has them, but it's a spectrum. It's not so much a binary outcome, one or zero. Um, but environmental exposure can be a source of this. We've got a couple of folks who have high neutralizing antibody levels, um, yet have never been dosed with a microdystrophin, which is, which is an interesting case. And, and a number of families have run into this as well, um, this, this idea of, of uh, environmental exposed uh, to neutralizing antibody, whether um, it was due to a cold or something else in the past is not quite clear. Um, but what is clear is that significant levels of neutralizing antibody will um, not allow the successful delivery of of AAV-based therapeutics, whether it's CRISPR, whether it's gene replacement, it doesn't much matter um, as far as it relates to AAV neutralizing antibodies, what goes in the AAV, um, but, but neutralizing antibodies are a problem. And of course, if, if uh, there are patients who have been treated with um, AAV before, um, you'll see the levels of, of neutralizing antibodies skyrocket in, in some of the analysis we've done. Um, we've seen AAV-treated patients have um, uh, neutralizing antibody levels uh, at a one to five thousand or so tighter, um, and the idea is that the that the numbers reported are actually on a uh, on a on a ratio basis, um, and and how that works is that researchers will uh, take a serum sample, um, dilute it until um, the the rate at which AAV could uh, transduce those cells or interact with those cells is about 50%. And so the question is, how many times do we have to dilute it in order to um, see that roughly 50% transduction rate? And a big challenge here is that there's not necessarily a standardization yet of, of neutralizing antibody assessments. Um, there's a lot of variability uh, in these. There, there hasn't been a standard one yet. Athena um, Health does have a, uh, uh, a clinical grade uh, neutralizing antibody test uh, for AAV9 at the moment. I believe others are coming, but at the moment it's just nine. Um, the one that we've used uh, historically has been a research grade assay, which is um, why no medical decisions, of course, can be based off of it. Um, with that being said, 
one of our other accomplishments in 2020 was uh, the, the establishment of a AAV neutralizing antibody screening uh, research study, which uh, with uh, our partnership with University of Massachusetts has allowed us to consent patients or subjects into the research study who are interested in, in learning uh, for informational purposes only not to make medical decisions off of, but for information only, you know, where they or their loved one stands with regards to neutralizing antibodies. Um, it, it, it's, it became very obvious that this was not a topic that was talked about enough within the community. And so we, we've put efforts behind a growing awareness of neutralizing antibodies and, and helping families get, get access to at least one insight, one data point. Um, of course, levels change, can and will change. Of course, no decisions should be made off of it. Um, but at least to give families an understanding of where they stand on, on that spectrum it is quite important to us. And so we've, we've run a number of samples so far and, and are starting to, to see interesting trends. It's not necessarily that the older uh, an individual gets, the higher antibody levels they have. Actually, we have some data that, that suggests the opposite. Um, yet some data does also suggest that um, having having significant neutralizing antibodies to AAV9, for instance, does yield uh, some some generally a correlation to having antibodies to um, AAV RH74, for instance. Of course, the two different serotypes used currently for at least uh, Duchenne micro dystrophin trials um, with with more to come. But ultimately, we want to get an understanding of the patient level population on what's called a seropositivity rate. Um, how what to what degree and what correlation is there between patients who have significant levels of neutralized antibodies that will uh, prevent the successful delivery of AAV. And um, later in the year, we'll, we'll be announcing some really uh, interesting um, uh, approaches to, to combating uh, neutralizing antibodies that aren't quite ready for the limelight yet, but um, if successful, uh, have, stand the chance to um, really have a, a great impact on, on the field broadly. Um, not just for our program, not just for uh, Duchenne, but, but gene therapy as a whole um, is generally been hampered by the inability to read those. So. Um, it'll be quite interesting, and and for all the families that have participated, you know, in this program, some of whom are on, on with us tonight, um, you know, big thanks. This is, um, you know, it's more than just it's more than just science. It's more than just a sample of blood. Um, I I really I understand on a personal level the the sort of apprehension and 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 energy that goes into um, any research study, but but especially especially a neutralizing antibody research study. So. Um, for those families that have participated and, and for those families that continue to reach out, you know, we thank you for that. You're, you're really helping out. Um, so as I mentioned, well, I alluded to, I suppose, not mentioned, just want to give a, a, a brief perspective on the timeline. I, I've changed this around since the last time we, we kind, of, kind of cut off the earlier days. Not that uh, the early days uh, matter so much now, but um, the idea that, you know, we, we've been able to move relatively quickly despite a, a global pandemic to, to dosing um, first patient as well as uh, bringing our other patients into preclinical development in the early development stages with the line of sight on, on really dosing um, our second group of patients sometime in 2022. We hope to start to get this regular um, sort of momentum going of dose of, of development and then dosing on a yearly and bi biannual basis. More to come, but but um, really the precedent that the first patient has sent, the, the, the infrastructure, the framework that has been built as a result of of our first patient has really, really paved the way for, for a lot of other patients to come afterwards. And we're very excited by that. Um, so I, I alluded to the FDA earlier. I think I spent a few minutes on it already. And as I see, I can't believe it's already 50 minutes past the hour already. But, um, you know, the FDA is, is very aware of these N equal one programs now. I think uh, last year at the same time, there was a, certainly a lower awareness. Um, but the idea that um, there's been a lot of advancement in the thinking at the FDA of how how do we how do we generate new guidelines and how do we support N of one drug development um, while also being careful to, to not um, allow the system to be abused. You know, I, I think it, it's a very cautious line to toe of of what separates an N of one or N equals a few from a larger drug development program. You know, where where is that line drawn and and how is it drawn and and what's the difference between the two sides? Um, these are not trivial questions, um, and, and uh, they they require a great deal of thinking. Um, a challenge certainly has been in advancing those, those that thinking has, has been, of course, COVID um, with the, the 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 not that I don't want to say distraction, but with the um, with the pandemic, it it sapped away a lot of those ongoing conversations 
uh, that have been occurring. And we're starting to see those conversations start to open back up now as we get into 2021. Um, of course, as vaccine proliferation uh, occurs throughout the country and, and, the, and globally, um, more of these conversations will again take center stage um, as, as, as we get back to business as was. And uh, ultimately, uh, as I've mentioned before, we we we're continue to advance the conversations around uh, reimbursement. Uh, we've uh, advanced this conversation now to um, start to target both public and private payers. And actually, just this afternoon, um, a board member and I had a great conversation with uh, one of the, uh, an executive from a, a large national payer, and really understanding what what's the difference in perspective between a private payer, you know, a, an Athena or not Athena, excuse me, an Aetna, a Blue Cross Blue Shield versus a, a Medicaid. Um, Medicaid goes state by state, and so the, th the thinking as it is now is that um, given that Medicaid is more of a holistic system, um, generally Medicaid patients stay on Medicaid, whereas with private insurance, uh, individuals will jump from private insurance to private insurance as their job changes. But um, there's there it appears to be a great opportunity um, with the state Medicaid programs to potentially look at running um, small pilot studies to understand you know, given, given both the direct medical costs, given the direct burden of this disease, you know, uh, the, the medicine, the, the hospital visits, the physical therapy visits, but also the indirect, uh, the, the loss of, the loss of uh, job, for instance, uh, the burden on caregiver, which is extreme, um, you know, to what degree does that make an economic justification for actually providing reimbursements, not necessarily for the entire um, cost of development, um, but, but for the pieces such as hospitalization and the production of the human grade therapeutic, um, for, for our therapeutic, I believe, uh, for our first one, the cost was around 1.3 million, um, for that 250 liter batch. And, and that's not cheap, right? And so how, how do we work with payers to, to eventually reimburse that and help to scale, scale this approach to others who need it, uh, desperately and, and, and have limited time? Um, there, there does appear to be an economic argument that can be made that, you know, for, for a cost of a million and a half or so, a rough number, very rough number, um, you know, to what degree does, does that justify our reimbursement? And, and given that the cost of at least Duchenne is very heavy, both in terms of direct cost, but also indirect cost, um, there does appear to be an, uh, uh, an argument to be made there. And, and we'll continue to build this out um, in partnership and, and look at developing models to make that justification and, and really having those um, conversations to to set up the first wave of, of uh, studies looking at looking at reimbursement um, in in 2021 and beyond. Um, so we we've got some uh, just as we're starting to close out here. Um, again, if there's questions, you know, feel free to feel free to chime in. Um, but uh, as we've um, it, well as we've moved beyond 2020, um, we'll be looking to have uh, both virtual and hopefully um, in person events in 2021. Uh, most most uh, near term, we'll be having our neutralizing antibody and our COVID webinar on um, February eighth coming up here. Um, we we've uh, taken a market step into uh, the world of esports. Uh, we find that it's quite interesting. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, esports are essentially um, video games on, on a larger level. And so sort of the traditional thought of, you know, playing a video game in your basement um, is actually transformed quite, quite broadly. And I encourage you to, to um, you, know, uh, you know, just Google esports and, and see, uh, I think there's a great piece on CNBC um, that documented the rise of esports. And, and it's very on brand for us. Um, I think a lot of a lot of rare disease patients, whether it's Duchenne or otherwise, um, you know, have, have difficulty in different abilities with mobility. And so, you know, how do we how do we carry out activities and events that are inclusive of our of our entire community? Um, and we've started to shy away from some of the other type of bike ride events, for instance, which um, you know preclude some individuals. So I'm really looking forward to that. We'll host those quarterly. We had uh, our our last one in December, a Fortnite tournament. I believe attracted over 300,000 uh, views, which was great. Um, it was uh, it got really good feedback from our community, and we were excited to do it again. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we'll have, uh, we, we skipped our gala in 2020 given the uh, crisis, but this year we'll actually have our gala in Connecticut, which will be very exciting. And a big thank you to the team putting that together. And then, of course, our annual golf tournament. With more to come, we'll, we'll be announcing more events um, as we go. Still, um, I think we've done a good job at trying to figure out how to navigate the, the virtual world uh, in terms of awareness and fundraising. Um, I can't say that we're pros at it yet, but well, we're certainly more experienced than we were uh, a year ago, at least. So we'll continue that and, and love the community's feedback on events that they like uh, and want to see or don't want to see and things like that. Um, I think a, a 
a good function of our ability to move quickly is is really the community's input. So, um, so it, for for folks that are interested in uh, just rounding the slide out, that that COVID webinar um, will will be uh, COVID and neutralizing antibody webinar. Will be we I think we posted that a couple of times on our social media. Um, I encourage folks to sign up. Uh, it should be interesting. It'll be another hour. We'll bring in uh, Federico Mizzoni, who is uh, one of the world uh, thought leaders as it comes to as it pertains to neutralizing antibodies, um, and then also uh, Noah Weisleder, who uh, his lab converted uh, from a muscle lab. At Ohio State to a uh, COVID, um, uh, partly COVID lab. So it'll be great to see their perspective and also the perspective on any immunogenicity concerns as it relates to the COVID vaccine um, impact on neutralizing antibodies for AAV. We've gotten a number of questions um, on that topic. Um, we'll be putting out a um, uh, some guidance on the um, COVID vaccine as it relates. But um, the quick takeaway is that at least for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, we haven't seen. Um, any cross reactivity with AAV, thankfully. Uh, of course, you should consult your your uh, your clinician before getting any vaccine or anything. But um, was pleased to see that as a result. Was quite worried before, but um, fortunately, we were able to run that analysis. Um, just finishing up here, uh, we we were fortunate to be in a number of different media outlets here. We're looking forward to, to 2021 and what that'll bring and, and all the excitement as we continue to build awareness. Um, but just as we close, you know, uh, really thank you for joining us tonight. Um, you know, if you have questions afterwards, happy to happy to answer. But if you'd like to learn more, you know, I encourage you to go to our website, connect on social media, um, and and uh, if you'd like to get more involved, you know, happy to happy to have that conversation. Feel free to reach out to me. I think my email was on the first slide, but um, on the last slide. But thank you. Appreciate the time, and if you'd like to like to further the conversation, then encourage you to reach out and um, come part of the community. I'll hang around here a bit uh, for a few minutes afterwards. Uh, if there's any questions, you're welcome to drop them in chat or um, drop them in. Uh, you can direct message me too if you're a bit shy. I know it's not always the most fun to put the question in on a webinar, but really appreciate everybody joining. And uh, you know, with that, I hope everybody has a great evening. Um, again, we'll be having another webinar um, on the COVID and neutralizing antibody aspect um, in February. Uh, I see Rachel posted the link there if you'd like to sign up. It'd be great to have you. And I hope everybody has a wonderful evening and, and stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sherry. Thanks, Barbara. Appreciate you coming here. Thanks, Enzo. Have a great night.